It's really exciting to be presenting to you today. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. As you all heard, my name is Ruben Ajar and um, be your presenter for today. I'm going to be talking about our newest automated platform, the MMA Quattro for plasmid purification. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, quickly about an introduction of how we ended up uh, bringing this product to the market, as well as the product itself and all the features. I'll also take you through the workflow, followed by the test data and the performance. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about the related products that could help you, whether you're working upstream or downstream from plasmid purification. And I will be giving you a sneak peek into our next project that we're actively working on at Genscript. So I actually started my career early on with plasmid purification, and it was one of the most challenging and most tedious pain points that I got to experience in a laboratory. Um, later on, I ended up working with automation at various roles, including uh, as a user, as well as a company that actually made the robotic liquid handling platforms. And I was able to uh, get a sense of what are the wonderful aspects of our automation as well as the limitations of automation. So I hope that what you see today from the solution standpoint is going to be um, delivering on some of those pain points and eliminating the challenges that are more limiting in the automation world. So plasmids have actually been around for many, many years, coming up actually on 100 years. Um, the actual term plasmid was introduced in the early 50s, and it was around the 70s that the DNA cloning technology uh, was introduced. Around 1980s was when the purification of the plasmid was finally um, done successfully with various methods, um, which actually ended up really uh, changing the way a lot of the laboratory work around plasmids and transfecting ended up taking place. So whenever we talk about plasmids, we have to think about the different requirements as well as the different challenges with every um, particular application that plasmids are being used at. So whenever we're working with plasmids on a smaller scale or maybe on a research scale, the requirements are not going to be as stringent and not as limiting as they would be in a clinical setting. Of course, industrial is going to be in between, but that's really going to be closer, um, of course, to the preclinical or clinical grade plasmid. So the higher up you go in the scheme of, of quality, it typically also um, the requirements for the quantity. So of course, when you're doing molecular cloning, you're going to be using smaller quantities of, of plasmid DNA. When you're going into the transfection and uh, antibody uh, production or any kind of therapeutic uh, production, you're going to be using significantly more plasmid DNA. And of course, the requirement, the quality of the plasmid is going to be very different than when you are working with plasmid DNA in a research setting. So, of course, there's been quite a bit of different methodology identified for the purification of the plasmid itself. Um, quite a bit of them are, are going to be, um, um, you know, impacting the downstream application. Um, but, of course, at this point in, in the uh, laboratory setting, majority of the people are really using the alkaline lysis, where you're using chemicals to burst the E. coli cell open to get the plasmid out of that host. That you've grown it. So, um, of course, a lot of the common methodologies are going to be column filter based, where you have to basically um, uh, lyse your cell open, take that, um, they take that lysis, uh, neutralize it, and then, of course, run it through that column and take it through the series of washes, followed by elution. That is, of course, a very labor intensive step, but that is actually one of the most commonly used methodologies. Every single method that you're seeing up here has its own um, value, and it has also its own um, a down, a downstream uh, application that could cause challenges. From the GenScript perspective, we actually based our solution on the magnetic silica beads, as we found 
that this is really the most optimal way to handle large scale uh, volume as well as large scale throughput. So what you're seeing in front of you right now is actually the traditional plasmid purification with regards to, again, what is typically used, which is, of course, the filter column. So at every step, almost every step that you're seeing here, there's typically a centrifugation step. So you go from your resuspension of your plasmid, uh, of, your, um, uh, of your bacteria into the lysis, the neutralization. Of course, you do a centrifugation here. You do your binding and then a series of washes, which again require a centrifugation at every single one of them. And lastly, your elution. The process is not only um, very intensive with regards to pipetting, but also very intensive with regards to centrifugation, as we mentioned uh, earlier. It's also very time consuming, and the biggest challenge ends up coming up whenever you're working with large volume of liquid. So you end up severely slowing down. I think that usually people would agree that if you're working with a mini prep scale, it typically takes you less than an hour. But when you're working with maxi, mega, or even giga, it typically takes you half a day to purify a very few samples, maybe even three or four. And it ends up taking you a significant amount of time. So with that said, um, the GenScript team came up with what you're seeing in front of you, which is a completely automated, large-scale, high-throughput plasmid purification solution. The solution is actually an, a complete, all-inclusive solution. It's not only the automated platform, but it also includes the verified protocols that are pre-programmed onto the instrument, the actual consumables as well that are needed to run the plasmid purification are also part of the solution. So with that said, what the user will end up obtaining with this one, um, basically one comprehensive solution is that an out of the box, ready to go um, setup. So the user theoretically can purchase the system, take it out of the box, load their culture onto it, load the actual consumables and hit go within a few hours of getting the instrument. So scientists now don't have to do their their own val validation, their own verification. We made sure that the protocols that are pre-programmed into the solution, into the system, are actually verified and work very well with a wide variety of different plasmid setups. Another thing that is that was key in the design of the instrument, which I think speaks miles of the expertise of the GenScript team and understanding the pain points of not only throughput, but also automation, is the fact that the solution is actually scalable and completely modular. So what you're seeing in front of you is actually, to the right-hand side, is the controller that can control up to four modules that are completely independent of one another. So the four modules to the left-hand side are individual purification modules that are completely ran independent of one another. So if a scientist is okay with a setup of six samples at a time, they don't need more than one module. So one controller and one module is capable of running six samples at a time. If their throughput grows a few months later, not a problem. They can add another module to the setup or maybe a third or a fourth as their system needs grow and their throughput groups. So with that said, again, I wanna highlight the fact that each one is completely independent of one another and each module can be ran independent of one another. So if you wanna run a different program or if you wanna run a different, um, uh, a different times of the day, not a problem. Each one is completely independent of one another. So as I mentioned before, if you have a four module setup, with six samples per, e per each module, that means you can actually run 24 samples in one go. The system itself, of course, is a pipetting uh, liquid handler. And the precision of the pipetting is really good. It's actually a CV of 3%. And one thing I wanna highlight here is um, typically that the culture limitation, the volume of the bacterial culture uh, is not necessarily what I would 
um, basically specify would be the limitation. It's really the bacterial pellet once the sample uh, is centrifuged down. So the first thing that the, that the scientist has to do is grow their culture overnight uh, in their media, and then they have to actually spin down that culture and weigh that bacterial wet pellet. That bacterial wet pellet has a range that we have um, identified to be optimal for the quattro set. The optimal range is going to be 0 0.3 to 1.5 bacterial wet pellet. So if you're less than that, quality of the plasmid of the DNA might not be as good. If you're higher than that, you're not going to get good lysis, which of course indicates you're not going to be able to obtain your DNA, which is very similar to really any kind of um, um, lysis step. This is not unique to the GenScript solution. The runtime is going to be approximately two hours. So theoretically, you can typically run this instrument uh, probably three times a day. The runtime, of course, varies depending on the protocol that you're running. So two to two and a half hours are going to be the typical runtimes. What you will end up with is transfection-ready purified plasmid, which of course means high-purity plasmid that has low endotoxins, uh, below 0 0.1 EU per microgram, and a very high supercold ratio, which is exceeding the 80 to 90% ratio that is typically indicative of the quality of the plasmid that you're working with. So a lot of people think that the supercold ratio is one of the key factors that are going to be uh, indicating whether or not you're going to be successful in your downstream application. So studies have actually shown that. And as I mentioned earlier in the slide before, the consumable kit is included in the solution. It includes the, the, um, the full scope of what is needed to run the Emma Quattro plasmid purification set. Um, the consumable itself is all-inclusive, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. But this is something that I really want to highlight because it's something that is not typically done in any kind of um, a setup. Usually the, the user or the scientist has to actually supply additional components to be able to run the, this solution. And lastly, but definitely not least, is the use or the ease of use of the interface. So I mentioned before that the solution has the pre-programmed verified protocols. This is, again, included in the system. However, if the scientist wants to program their own protocol, not a problem. They can actually do that using the interface. And I will give you an example of the interface in a little bit. But it is very user-friendly, uh, and there's quite a bit of different uh, checks that we implemented to ensure correct loading of the instrument, as well as um, metrics that don't violate um, the, um, the various recommendations that we have that we know will enable you to be successful. So again, it speaks to the expertise of the GenScript solution and the team that actually worked on this platform and this consumable. So this is basically um, the consumable kit. What you're seeing in front of you is actually the tip box that includes a filter tube that will be the final elution tube. This is loaded up here in the platform. The next component in the consumable is the reagent cartridge. This reagent cartridge contains all the magnetic beads that I mentioned before, as well as the buffers uh, and the wash, um, uh, uh, wash buffers and the elution. It also includes all the tubes as well as the waste. So as you can see here, it is an all-inclusive kit. You do not need to worry about ordering multiple components to run this platform. It is completely, um, incl completely um, included in one. It's all in one. And one of the nice things about the GenScript kit is that it is very cost-effective. One of the biggest things about um, Maxi, Mega, and Gigapreps, the fact that the actual cost per sample is fairly high. Um, so, of course, when you automate, typically people want to see some cost savings, whether it's labor or whether it's uh, from a consumable standpoint. You will see that the consumable for the GenScript solution is actually less than the market average.
and again, all inclusive of all the different components that are needed. So I want to take a couple minutes to actually introduce you to the full workflow. What you're seeing here within the blue um, haloed box is completely automated. So this is not something that the scientist has to worry about, but I still wanted to take a few moments to talk about the full workflow because I do think it's very really interesting to understand how the solution works. Everything outside of the haloed box is actually manual. So as I mentioned before, the first step, of course, when you're doing plasmid purification is to grow your culture offline. Um, once your culture is grown, you're going to take your Emma Quattro tube and you're going to centrifuge your culture using that Emma Quattro tube. So one of the big things about using um, the consumables is that they're pre-configured to fit into the GenScript solution, but they also have other components tied to the way that the system works. So for example, the tube that is used in the GenScript setup uh, actually has internal baffles that enables really good resuspension of the bacterial pellet, as well as really good mixing when you're binding that plasmid DNA. So that particular tube is going to be used um, to um, go ahead and load your bacterial pellet into it. So one thing that the scientists can choose if they are working with a really large volume, they could potentially uh, centrifuge the bacterial pellet using their own flask and then remove that, that bacteria pellet, scoop it out and put it into the tube. Or again, they can use that, that tube to basically spin down the culture. Once the spinning down of the culture is done, you go ahead and you load your bacterial pellet onto the instrument deck. Of course, you pour off that supernatant, you load your tips, you load your tubes, and of course you load your reagent cartridge. You go ahead and hit start. And again, everything you're seeing in that blue haloed box is completely automated. So the instrument will take the um, first step of basically resuspending the bacterial pellet it's going to do the lysis, the neutralization, followed by the pre-clarification step, which, of course, is usually removing the host DNA as well as the cell debris and other contaminating components once the cell has been lysed. That, of course, includes proteins, RNA, all kinds of contaminants that would be in your, uh, in your solution. After you remove that debris and that contaminating um, um, uh, basically components, you're going to go ahead and bind your plasma DNA. After the binding, the system will go ahead and do a series of washes uh, that include specified washes to include those endotoxins. So that will really enable us to get to that really pure uh, plasmid. After that, the system will go ahead and perform an elution. And the final step is to remove that elution, remove um, the full um, uh, supernatant and dispense it into that, I, you probably remember from my previous slide, into that elution tube that contains the filter. So once the elution tube has been, um, um, ha the liquid has been dispensed into that elution tube, the run is complete. So the, the scientists will walk up to the instrument, cap that tube containing the uh, eluted DNA and centrifuge it offline. That final centrifugation step through that filter in that column is going to remove any trace residual endotoxins as well as any residual magnetic beads. This is a very important step to remove any final endotoxins. So I definitely do not recommend skipping that step. However, if you choose, that is something that you technically can skip. And that's basically it. So again, centrifugation at the beginning to ensure that you are um, um, you know, ready to go into your resuspension and then centrifugation after you've done your elution. Those are the only two manual uh, setups at the beginning and of course at the end of the run. What you're seeing now is the user interface, which the first screen that you're seeing on the top left corner is showing you the main uh, controller. So um, as I mentioned before, the actual uh, controller can control up to four modules. And this, for this particular example, you can see that the 
what the system is connected to only one module. So only one module is online while the remainder modules are grayed out because they are technically offline. Um, when you go into module number one, there's a couple different settings that you can actually select from. You can do the programming, you can export. This is basically exporting the runs that you have conducted before. You can go into the general settings and of course you can do um, system upgrades on the instrument itself. Uh, basically, this is just showing you the different parameters that um, the user will have control over. So this is actually my favorite part of the interface. Um, or maybe my second favorite, I'll talk about um, a couple other features uh, in a minute. But one of the big things about laboratory automation, of course, is that you want to ensure that you are set up properly. Because once you hit go, you can no longer intervene or stop the run and potentially rectify an error that the user uh, had done with the setup. So it's really important to ensure proper loading before you start your run. Otherwise, you jeopardize the whole, um, uh, the whole run and potentially completely um, waste your samples. So again, it speaks to the expertise of the GenScript team that has developed this, our, our knowledge of the different pain points of automation. So what you're seeing here is basically um, a feature of the platform before you start your run where you scan the lab or that the user has loaded onto the deck. So row number one, you're seeing what is loaded from a tip perspective. So you can see the instrument says, yes, yes, yes. So all six uh, positions have been loaded. The second row is the reagent cartridges. And you can see that it actually is giving you a number. So this is actually the barcode. So the reagent cartridges are actually equipped with a barcode that are read using that scan feature then the reaction tubes, the sample tubes, and finally that waste. So you probably recall that I had mentioned earlier that the system is completely modular. That means that you do not have to run six samples at a time. So this particular example, the six samples are loaded because obviously we want to run six samples, but in reality, the user does not have to have this um, setup completely filled up. So you could potentially have half or maybe even one sample if you choose. But instead of yes, you will end up seeing no. So it gives the user a visual indication of whether or not the system is fully set up or partially set up. And the user will have a visual check to confirm that what they are seeing is indeed what they, sh what they um, should be loading. After that, they'll go ahead and hit start. And one again, one of the very nice features is that the system will give you a calculated a number of how long the instrument will take to complete the run. Of course, that's dependent on the program that you are selecting. If you want to do, um, let's say, less washes or less binding or maybe a different, um, a different elution time, all those factors are going to impact how long the run is going to take. So it's going to give you that countdown. Uh, and the last screen I have for you is to show you during the run what the user has the ability to see. So during the run, the user can walk up to in the instrument and see in real time what step of the process the instrument has conducted and completed and what step it's currently running. So you can see here that the system has ran through the resuspension, the lysis, the neutralization, and it is currently at the pre-clarification step. It has yet to run the supernatin transfer as well as the binding along with multiple washes and finally the elution. What you're seeing on the bottom right hand corner again is a countdown of how long is left on the run. So let's say the scientist gets distracted and they end up you know not paying attention to how much time is left over on their run. Not a problem. They can walk up to the instrument, check what step it's on and also check how much time is left in the run. So that's basically another very nice feature that really enables you to plan your day effectively. Now I'm going to be talking a little bit about the performance data, which I hope you find to be useful. And of course, the point here is to give you an idea of what to expect if you were to choose to work with the Macquatro solution. So for the first case study, um, what we did is compare side by side the purification using the Emma Quattro in a manual solution, 
and we actually did it with two different plasmids. So the first two samples that you're seeing here uh, were ran on the Emma Quattro, which was PUC DNA 3.1 and PUC DNA 3.4. And the second two uh, samples that you're seeing, sample three and four, were ran using a manual kit. Again, 3.1 and 3.4. So it was really a side-by-side -side analysis. Um, and what you're seeing here is that we ended up eluding the Emma Quattro with one ML volume, and we eluded the, um, uh, the manual solution with 500 microliters. So it wasn't truly the same from an elution standpoint, but I do want to mention here that you can technically go down um, with the Emma Quattro to an elution of 500. It was just that particular setup that the team conducted. They chose to go with one ML. Um, so what you're seeing here is from a concentration, what we ended up with was about one mg per milliliter for the Emma Quattro and about uh, 1,500 mg per milliliter for the manual solution. But again, of course, um, the GenScript solution was more dilute. So in reality, our concentration was a little bit higher when we looked at the manual versus the automated system. However, the other metrics, OD to 60 to 80 to 60 to 30, endotoxin levels, as well as the super cold ratio were basically equivalent. Um, that again indicates the purification setup, as well as the outcome of the purity of the plasmid and the form of the plasmid. So, of course, that's, again, indication of whether or not you're going to be successful in the downstream application. And the last thing I want to mention is the gel to the right-hand side. So we ran a side-by-side -side analysis, um, gel electrophoresis, using the four samples that we ran. And you can see, basically, the purity of the plasmid, as well as the format of the plasmid, whether or not it's a super cold ratio. So for the second case study, um, I wanted to mention a couple notes here. It's really important to keep in mind that whenever you're doing a plasmid setup, what you, the limiting factor always is going to be is, of course, the plasmid itself. Whether or not you're working with a high copy plasmid, a low copy plasmid, if you're working with an insert that's toxic, um, another factor, of course, the growth conditions. Another factor would be the actual media that is being used for the growth. So one thing that um, a lot of you, a lot of scientists end up working with, is typically LB media, which is not necessarily a very rich media. So the growth conditions are not always going to be optimal. Uh, a lot of scientists end up choosing to work with terrific broth, because of course it's a very rich media. So they end up seeing more robust results with the terrific broth. So for this particular example, what we ended up doing is we grew 100 ml TB and 100 ml L LB, and we compared them side by side across six samples. So three samples for LB and three samples for TB. And when we weighed that bacterial culture, once we centrifuged it down, what we saw is about 0 0.8 grams for the LB on average, and about 1.2 grams for the TB. I have to say that I've seen actually sometimes double for the TB. Again, it really has to do with the plasmid as well as the other conditions that impact the growth of the bacteria and the plasmid itself. But for this purpose, uh, for this case study, what you're seeing here is, is typically also something that scientists would also expect. So about a 30% increase in the growth of the bacteria itself. What's really interesting is that once we purified the plasmid, and got to, constant, got to the concentration aspect. For the LB culture, even though it was about 30% more growth, more bacteria, we ended up with about 400 nanograms per microliter in the concentration of the plasmid. However, the TB was actually close to 800, so almost double, even though, again, the uh, bacteria was a closer to 30%. So not only did the bacteria grow more, but the plasmid itself was more uh, optimal. Um, the actual um, plasmid replication was more enhanced in the TB culture. Uh, with regards to the ODs, the 260 to 80 to 60 to 30, the endotoxin levels, as well as the super cold ratios, those were all comparable. So again, this case study is just to give you an indication of what to expect when you're doing different conditions. This is not necessarily the Emma Quattro itself. 
The next case study I would like to give you is more about the downstream application, which shows the protein expression, uh, which of course is an indication of whether or not the plasmid itself is clean and is going to be successful for the protein expression aspect. So what you're seeing here is that we grew a total of six samples in 150 ml overnight, 16 hours. And what we did is we did 50 ml LB and, and 50, uh, sorry, 50 percent LB and 50 percent 2XYT. Those are those are two different medias that were basically uh, mixed together. So 2X2YT is a little bit richer than LB, but definitely not as rich as TB. And the plasmid that was used was a PUC DNA, which of course is a high copy plasmid. So what you're seeing here on the on the left hand side is the table showing the concentration of the plasmid, as well as the 260 to, 8, 260 to 80, 260 to 30, and then the elution volume. So you can see that approximately across the board, what we ended up with was about 400 to 500 nanograms per microliters. So we took these six samples and we did the same setup using a manual kit. So um, the same um, uh, setup, as I mentioned before, the culture volume, the culture um, time, the actual media, the plasmid, everything was replicated in an identical manner. But again, it was purified using um, the manual kit. On the right hand side, what you're seeing is actually the expression, the protein expression. We took the manual um, a purified plasmid and we took the Emma Quattro purified plasmid and we transfected them into the host and we measured the expression level. And what you're seeing is basically on the, um, on the left hand side, the bar that's gray is the manual um, uh, plasmid and the bar that is green is going to be the Emma Quattro plasmid. So plasmid number one was basically equivalent. Plasmid two was a little bit, was definitely higher for the quattro. Again, three was more equivalent. Four was more manual and so forth and so on. So on average, what you should be expecting with the Emma quattro is equivalent performance to a manual kit. That's really the essence of this um, case study. The next case study I have is also in relation to the transfection efficiency. Very similar to the study before, what we're trying to show here is whether or not the actual um, uh, purity of the plasma DNA that is obtained from the Emma Quattro is going to enable you to be successful in your downstream application. So what we did here is actually get a controlled plasmid, a manually prepped controlled plasmid from our service department. I think everyone probably on the call have heard of Genscript services team. This is really uh, one of the most, um, you know, experienced um, um, uh, departments that we have at Genscript. Um, they're really uh, well known for providing high quality plasma DNA, uh, which is really considered one of the top um, industry standards. So by using the plasmid that is provided by them, we, uh, of course, uh, would, would expect high quality um, results. So what we ended up doing here is we tested using luciferase reporter G and we ran two additional samples using the Emma Quattro. And what we ended up doing is uh, testing the luminescence that is, uh, again, indicating um, the um, transfection efficiency using the, um, the uh, pl plasmid that was prepared by the services department, which is the um, plot that you're seeing in blue versus the two samples that were ran on the Emma Quattro, which is the plot that you're seeing in purple and green. Um, and what you're seeing in front of you is actually the Genscript uh, prepared plasmid performed um, um, uh, actually better than the manual solution. So again, it speaks to um, the performance of, of the actual Emma Quattro purification, getting you to that really pure plasmid and getting you to the successful results that you want to see when you're doing transfection. So in summary here, test case number one, ink test case number two. So the purple and the green bars were both showing better transfection efficiency than the manual kit. And the last case study I have for you today is actually uh, showing a PLNT um, um, transfection efficiency. Uh, 
So what we did here uh, was a little bit different than the two other case studies. So we did a PLNT um, um, vector. So it's actually a three uh, part uh, plasmid, right? I'm, I'm sure a lot of people on the call were probably um, are probably experts in this. So we did the purification again using a Macquatro. So you're seeing um, the top um, a left hand side table um, and showing the Macquatro purification. And then the bottom one, sample number two is the control, which again was done using a manual kit. The elution for the Macquatro was 1.5 ml. And then the elution for the control was um, basically 500, so one third. And the reason why we did that is actually was on purpose. So um, I'll explain that in a minute. We wanted to show whether or not the purity of the plasmid, um, again, is going to be a key factor in showing the uh, actual titer, the actual transfection efficiency of the p lenti titer. So what you're seeing here is that the bottom um, table is that what we ended up doing is that we replicated the two samples, the control, and we replicated the two samples, the MMA quattro. So one and two were the control, and then three and four were the MMA quattro. So what you're seeing to the, to the uh, right-hand side of that table is the average titer. So for the control, you're seeing about 50 uh, for the um, uh, titer, and about uh, same thing for the MMA quattro, approximately 50, even though the concentration of the plasmid DNA was one third. So again, going back to that table on the top side, um, on the top uh, is that the concentration was closest, closer to 300 nanograms per microliter for the m quattro and about one milligram per milliliter for the control. So again, even though it was one third the dilution of the actual um, uh, control group, the m quattro showed equivalent performance with regards to the transfection efficiency. And now I actually have a video for you that I would like to show you. Um, a couple things I want to highlight before I show the video is that the actual um, uh, Quattro is equipped with um, not only the scanning to enable seamless loading, but it is also equipped with puncturing tools. That way, when you load your consumable onto the deck, um, it is completely enclosed and maintained, so there's no potential cross-contamination. And also, the system is equipped with index mixers. Those index mixers will enable us to really bind um, the plasma DNA, as well as really ensure the plasma is mixed well and cleaned up properly. So those were all key components in ensuring not only a very uh, seamless process, but also a very clean DNA and very clean process to ensure there's no potential cross-contamination. So with that said, I'll go ahead and hit play. So with that, I'm, I'm basically done for the portion for the Emma Quattro. I do want to take a couple moments to just mention that um, GenScript, we actually recently celebrated our 20th anniversary. We've been around for um, 20 years and we've expanded significantly from um, a very tiny, tiny uh, startup with $5,000 in New Jersey in 2002 
all the way to the company that we are today with multiple divisions, multiple departments, and quite a bit of off-the-shelf solutions, which uh, obviously what you saw today pre me presenting on. So the reason why I want to show this is not to potentially brag about GenScript, but I actually want to mention that we are constantly expanding because we want to hear about what are the pain points that you are challenged with as scientists. So if there's something that you, that you need that you do not see, if there's something that, um, that you feel is, is an unmet need, please reach out to us. Please let us know. We want to hear from you. So I definitely invite you to reach out to us and, and potentially make us your partner. Again, maybe, maybe not with this particular product, but with others. We actually have quite a bit of different off-the-shelf solutions, including reagents and devices. Uh, I do want to highlight here that we have a full protein workflow. What you're seeing to the left-hand side is what we call our MMAG SA+, which is a completely um, uh, com very simple, semi-automated, and very affordable automated purification setup. You can do protein and or antibody purification, and you can actually do it in a 12-sample setup. Uh, and it takes really a significantly less amount of time. You can actually do it in about an hour for 12 samples. Um, we also have electrophoresis and Western blotting solutions, whether you're just doing a, uh, a gel run or um, the precast gels that we have, our SurePage gels are really good performing. They have loading capacity that exceeds a lot of the products that are offered in the industry. It's the well shape that they have. We also have um, a, a wet staining system. We call it the e-stain. We have a we have our e-blot, which basically enables you to transfer, and then we have an automated Western device. So a full protein uh, a purific, a protein workflow, including purification to the analysis. And lastly, I want to conclude with a sneak peek into a system that we're currently working on. So this is something that is not launched, uh, and it's a completely automated protein purification setup. It's going to be a larger scale. So what I showed you before, the MMAG is say plus. The capacity of that system is going to be 50 ml. You can technically condense your sample down um, by spinning it or by, um, by um, um, grabbing the magnetic beads and, and moving them into a tube. Uh, however, this the system that you're seeing here that I mentioned a minute ago is currently in development is going to be completely automated and it's going to be higher throughput. And one of the really nice things about it is going to uh, be the UV uh, readout. So you're going to be able to test the concentration as well as the various metrics of the sample on the go as the sample is getting purified. So we're really excited about the system. Uh, please um, uh, expect to see it hopefully in the next couple months, hopefully in the next um, uh, quarter or this following one. Uh, so um, I thank you very much for your time today, and I hope that you found that the information I provided informative. And again, I hope that you reach out with anything that you might need, or even if you just want to bounce some ideas around. So thank you very much, and I'll take any questions you have now.